I'm joined by the man himself, David Benavidez. Welcome back to Slothbox. David, how are you, man? How are you? What have you been up to today? I'm doing good, man. You know, just relaxing a little bit before I go back to train. But, you know, um, two weeks out to the fight, very excited and just ready to get this on. Yeah, I just want to go, talking about your boxing career, I want to go back to the beginning. How did it all start for you? Like, how did you find boxing itself? Like, what made you want to get into it? You know, honestly, the reason why I got into boxing is I wasn't really given an option. My brother was already a boxer already. And, you know, just being in there, um, my dad used to train my brother in the garage. So I would just pass there time to time. And then to one day, my dad just put me in there, started training. And that's basically all I remember. Um, and then we started watching boxing fights. And I, I really started to fall in love with the sport and in love with the knockouts and the, the brutal, the brutalness and the violence of the, of the fight. Um, I was never really, I didn't watch boxing, you know, to like a lot, a lot of people say, you know, the sweet science, you know, I wasn't really into the footwork or dancing around the ring. I was just more pulled in by the, by the knockouts and all that stuff. And since I was a little kid, I've always loved knockouts and all that. And even to, to now the way I fight, you know, I've always been that type of fighter that wants to go for the knockouts and inflict as much damage as possible as, but because that's what I've loved. That's what I fell in love with. You mentioned uh, your dad training yourself and your brother. What was that like? That like family, like camp, like training alongside your brother for all those years. What was that like? It was good. It was, it was, uh, it was good, but it was sometimes it was really annoying because my dad didn't know how to separate the gym life from life at home. You know, we're always kind of like, oh, he got you got to go run. So it was it was a little bit annoying after that, um, and it got tiring after a while. But after you get used to just living like that, it becomes a little bit easier because that just boxing and, the, and fitness becomes a part of your lifestyle, and it just gets embedded into you, and even in your body, it becomes muscle memory. You know, so um, it was it wasn't the best way to you know have a childhood. You know, because we didn't have a child. Me and my brother never had a childhood. You know, we. We, um, I'm sorry. We were, we we're always training, but I mean, if I could go back and do it again and change something, I wouldn't change anything. I would leave everything how it was because it, it worked out in my favor. Yeah, it's made you who you are today, I guess. And um, another decision made by yourself and your dad was sort of the opposite to your brother, not to have too many fights in the amateur game. I think you had, was it 15 amateur fights? Yeah, I had 15. Yeah, I had 15. But the reason I had 15 is because. Um, it wasn't because I didn't want to fight on there. It was just because I, I didn't really take boxing too serious. Yeah. I always trained, but my, my brother was the one with the more declarated amateur career. He was going, he won about 15 national titles and he was going up and down. And what people don't understand too, uh, you know, going back and forth to national tournaments, on it costs a lot of money, man. And it takes a lot of time out of you from school. So my mom didn't want me to miss out in school. And I just, I didn't really have the, the desire to, you know, train so hard like that when I was little. I trained because I didn't have a choice. My dad always made me train, but my brother took it to another level. He really took it more serious. But I, I had always been talented in the ring, and I always had sparring sessions. You know, I took it more serious when I was, um, when I was like, 13 years old, 12 years old. That's when I really made the transition to be like, oh, this is something I really want to do for a career, you know, um, as a, as, as, as a career for the rest of my life. And that's when I took it more serious. So like we said, you turned pro quite young. And um, I just wanted to know, because it doesn't happen so often, like, like we said, like most fighters build up their amateur pedigree, fight internationally sometimes. Did you face any struggles in the boxing game as you did turn pro at such a young age with, you know, not the best amateur experience? Did you face any struggles with that? No, I, I didn't face any struggles at all. Um, the thing about me was that when I went, when I went to Hollywood, I moved with my dad. We were training at, in Wildcard. I moved from Phoenix to Hollywood, and I had to lose a whole bunch of weight because I had stopped boxing for a year. And then I went to go move with my dad, and I started losing weight. And as the weight started coming off, um, I started sparring better fighters. Um, I started sparring top amateurs at the wild card and then i started sparring at 14 i sparred latif coyote coyote who was at the time he was a cruiserweight champion i was 14 and then i turned 15 and i sparred uh who was his name um kelly pavlik and then i sparred mm -hmm. golovkin oh. Gabriel Rosado. and then that's basically what i had that's that was my amateur career 
because you know it starts off off all fun and games when you're sparring these guys. You know the the champions or the professionals are sparring a little kid until a little kid catches them with a big shot. <laughs> then yeah, all yeah. the fun and games go out the window. So these guys are trying to kill me. So I basically. I've never been the fighter who just runs around. Even since I was a little kid, I was always, uh, I was like, you know, if they land one on me, I got to land one back or I got to land yeah, two. Yeah. So it's always been, you know, shot for shot with me when I was a little kid. And I feel like that's where I got my style from because I never backed down. It didn't matter what age I was or how much I weighed or how much little experience I had. I always, I always had that hunger in me. So that's what always kept me going. And then just sparring high pedigree level fighters you know like the champions I was working with that gave me a lot of my that's where I learned a lot of my professional style from because I was basically you know those are real fights they were not sparring sessions they were yeah, basically yeah. fights with with world champions so I learned a lot from there so I feel like I had an even better not amateur I had a better way of my my come up because I learned yeah, yeah. from champions and I didn't learn from amateur the amateurs I learned from champions so it's, it sounds like you were sort of learning on the job in sparring, but um, you've mentioned some great names there that you sparred at such a young age. And I just wanted to, if you even can pick one out, who was, who was the best you, best person you've sparred, especially at that young age? So, well, the best person I always sparred, and it's always going to be the same answer everybody asked me, is going to be Golovkin, because uh, he just, not only uh, offensively, but he's just the way he sets things up and, you know, his body shots, you have to be, when I sparred him, I was on point all the time. And this guy, he knew what I was coming from. He knew what I was going to throw. He knew what I was going to do this. He knew I was going to do that. So I had to be, I had to set stuff up in a way that was different where he didn't see it coming. If I wanted to throw a body shot, I had to throw two upstairs and land one downstairs. So I, there was a lot of different stuff. It's a lot of different stuff that you have to do just besides throwing to set other stuff up. So you know, he was a world champion and he was really good. You know, he had a lot of amateur experience too. So he knew a lot. So that just, you know, it, it elevated my game to think differently. And I had always had to be on my toes on him because if I was on an off day with him, you know, he hit extremely hard. So I had to be, I had to be, be there a hundred percent every time of the spine. And that, after I got done working in camps with him, my game was just elevated to a different level. So would you say with Golovkin, you took the most from those spars with him? Yeah. So I, yeah. And then definitely I took the most from the sparrings. And then once I sparred other people, it was just like, I was taking other people apart because his level of boxing, his IQ was so high that it just, like I said, it elevated my game to another level. I just want to move on, like fast forward into your career. And, um, it's pretty amazing being the youngest super middleweight world champion. I just wanted to ask that feeling in itself, you know, breaking a record like that, but not only breaking the record, it's the start of the legacy for yourself. What was that feeling like? Yeah, so it was good, man. It definitely, it was uh, one of the biggest accomplishments in my life. And that kind of makes it real, you know, because when you're younger, before you win a title, you're like, man, it's hard. I don't think I'm going to be able to win the title. And then you win a title, it makes the dream become real. So it, it was definitely a great, you know, uh, a great feeling. And then when you win that second title, it's like, okay, like this is, it's not, it's not impossible to do. And now, you know, obviously I made my mistakes and I'm coming back from them, but now I feel like I've won it twice. I'm going for my, my, in my head, you know, I want five more titles. And that's, that's the barrier I'm, I'm mm -hmm. setting for myself now because the first two, I mean, I'm 25 years old. I already won two world titles. Sometimes people, they box their whole lives and they never win one world title. And I'm 25, I won two of them. So I know I could win. I know I can win multiple world champions, world championships. So I'm just excited. I feel like the sky's the limit for me right now. And I'm just gonna keep working hard until I become the best in my era. And like, like you said yourself, you put it perfectly. Like some fighters, they win a world title and it feels like it's the peak for them. Like, yeah, I know, like you said, you've made some mistakes and you were stripped, but this certainly doesn't feel like the peak for you at such a young age. You put it perfectly again, the sky's the limit. Is it all about legacy for you in the sport of boxing? Yeah, I mean, I don't even, I don't see it as legacy right now. I'm not at that, in my head, I'm not at that point yet. At that, the point that I'm at right now is just being the best version of myself I could be. I feel like the legacy takes care of itself. Um, I feel like right now I'm just going to try to be the best version of myself. I'm going to try to be better than I was yesterday. And um, 
I haven't even hit my prime yet, you know, so I'm very excited to see how I hit, how I feel like when I hit my prime and I'm just, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm getting a lot of experience, you know, I'm working hard. So like I said, I'm excited for the future. I've already got 10 years in the boxing game and I'm 25. So I feel like I can go another 10 or 15. But moving on, we've got David Lemieux as your next opponent. It's quite a decent opponent as well. He's sort of, he's got a good resume himself. How's camp going for that fight and preparation leading up to that big fight at the end of the month? Camp has been amazing. I've been actually, this is probably one of my longer camps. I've been in camp for like four months, uh, almost four months and a half. And, you know, I give David Lemieux all the respect in the world because he's a great fighter. I've been watching him since I was younger. And he's very motivated, too, because I'm not the only one fighting for a title. He's fighting for a title, too. So it's an opportunity for him to win, too. So I got to take him extremely serious. Um, but I've done everything right. I've got my miles in. I'm close to weight. I've been got my rounds in for sparring. You know, I've done everything possible to give myself the best opportunity to win. And I'm excited, too, because David Lemieux, he's not no pushover. You know, he's going to be getting there giving a good fight. But I, the reason why I respect him a lot, too, is because other fighters, they didn't want to take this fight. You know, you got Charlo, you got Caleb Plant, you got Canelo. You know, these are all massive fights to make happen. But none of them wanted to, you know, step up to the table and make this fight happen. So for that reason, I do respect David Lemieux a lot. David Lemieux himself, like, he's, like we've both said, he's a great fighter. But you're one of the heavy hitters in the division. 25 fights, 22 KOs. Are we looking for that 23rd KO against that? Yeah, definitely. My mindset is I don't like to leave fights to the scorecards. Um, and I know I have the strength and the speed and the ability to stop anybody I put my hands on. So for me, in a perfect world, I've done everything right. And I want to eat. I want to end every fight in a knockout. Um, if I don't get it, hey, you know, I don't get it. But if I don't get it, I want to I want to make the fight. You know, I want to inflict as much punishment and much damage as possible. Um, but we're, we're going to be going to for the knockout. You know, even if it's 11th round, 12th round, and there's no knockout, you know, I'm still going to be that 12th round. I'm going to be attacking. I'm going to be looking for the knockout, you know, because that's just a fighter I am. And, you know, I want to give the, the fans the best fights possible. And, you know, uh, so we'll see what happens. You mentioned some names earlier, like Charlo, Plant, and the big one, Canelo, and them not stepping up to the plate, but... Are those names that we'll see Benavidez in the ring with in the future? I think so. I think after I win this belt, I think I'll have more leverage to make these fights happen. Um, and and if if I can't make those fights happen, I think it might be time to move up to 175. You know, um, I've been trying to get these fights for a long time, and there's no excuse why these fights aren't happening. The only reason it's not happening is because these guys, they don't want to fight. You know, uh, Charlo and all that, you know, these guys, this is a big fight. You know, everybody makes money with these fights. You know, if it's me and them, you know, this is a big fight. What other big fights other than Canelo, them fighting Canelo, the biggest fights they have on the table with me. But, you know, a lot of these guys, they're not as confident as they say they are. You know, they try to act, they talk a big game. They say this and that. But, you know, it for me, nothing's guaranteed. This is a 50-50 fight between me and them. I have confidence in myself and I know I can beat them. Yeah. But it's still a 50-50 fight. I got to put in the work. And that's what these guys, you know, they know that too. You know, they know that they're nothing is secure, but they're not confident in themselves like how I am. You know, yeah. and I'm just willing to – I'm willing to put my my O on the line to give the fights a good, the fans a good fight and to show that I am the best. So, like I've said, if they don't accept the fight, then I've done mo all I could do. So, if they don't want to get the fights, then I might move up to 175. Talking to one of those names we mentioned, Canelo, had a big fight at the weekend and it was a loss. I just wanted to get your thoughts. Like, Bivol was no pushover, but what did Canelo do wrong in the ring against him at the weekend? I feel like what Canelo did wrong, and, and I've been saying it a lot, I mean, he's not God, bro, and he's not, he's not the type of fighter that's going to make it hard for you. He's going to stay in front of you. He's going to be looking for the knockout all night, too. But... I feel like he came in riding on his high horse. And you could tell that, too, because he was talking about he could be Usyk, you know, at 2 <laughs> yeah, one yeah. which was absurd to me. Like, I can't even believe he said that. But he just thinks that he could hurt whoever he puts his hands on. And I feel like what he did wrong, too, is he had no game plan. He was just going in there. He was throwing a lot of hooks. He was just hitting the arms. And he thought that the fight could end in just one shot. And, you know, with the fighter, like, Bivol is a talented fighter. He moves around a lot. 
you can't just expect to knock them out with one shot. You got to set it up. You know, you got to throw more than one shots to hide the power shot. You know, he was just throwing one power shot after another. So that's what he did wrong in that fight. And Bivol, you know, took advantage of him, you know, and uh, he's a big fighter, strong fighter. And, you know, uh, hats off to Bivol because it was one of the best victories of his life. Like post fight, like on social media, I'm looking to see what the reaction is to the lot, not only the Canelo loss, but for me, the Bivol win. Like, like you said, Canelo was on his high horse and everyone, you know, he's the pound for pound king at the minute. That's how people regard him. And, the scorecards alone, like, Bivol certainly didn't get the credit for that fight. And um, what did you think of those scorecards? Because they were so close, but for me watching, the fight didn't look that close at all. No, it was that, those those uh, scorecards were shit, to be honest with you. Mm. And honestly, when I heard uh, majority decision, I'm like, oh, they're going to give this to Canelo. Yeah. You know, because that's what happens in big fights like that when it's the money guy, you know, the, the face of, the the purse basically you know and i was like 115 113 that don't make sense i didn't see that i only thought canelo won like two or three rounds to be honest with you i'm being generous with three rounds but um you know they got it right though you know um well they didn't get the scoring right but they got as as long as they got the victory right it was cool but and then also canelo too you I mean he, he's just i feel like he's delusional too he said he did enough to win the fight so i mean it makes no sense, but I feel like, you know, he's still in denial and stuff. But uh, Bivol, he looked good that night, so I'm, I'm really happy for him. Bivol, after the, re- after the fight, said that for a rematch, maybe coming down to Canelo's natural weight and taking his belts at that weight. How, do, how would you see that rematch going at Canelo's, well, more natural weight and Bivol coming down, obviously dropping weight? How Would you like to see that rematch? And if so, like, how, how do you see that going? I mean, I think they should fight at 175 because, I mean, he beat him at 175, so he should – I think Bivol shouldn't be trying to make it easier for Canelo. I mean, he – you know, he took less money than what he was entitled to. And, you know, he fought Canelo. Canelo was fighting for his belt, so he should give him a rematch at 175. But, I mean, if Bivol wants to go 168, I mean, uh, I don't think Bivol walks around too heavy anyways. I think he can make 168 easy. But, I mean, I feel like he should fight at 175. He's the one who beat him. So, why should we go down lower and wait? You know, it makes no sense. But, I mean, we'll see We'll see what happens. Speaking of Bivol, like, obviously, yourself, you're still young in the game. You've got a lot to prove at your own weight. But would you like to mix it in the ring with him at some point? Yeah, definitely. I feel like uh, we sparred before. We had some great sparring sessions. How'd that so go? We, I, it was good, man. It was good. Good sparring session. Um, so, I mean, I feel like uh, we could definitely put some good fights on for the fans. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully we get a fight in, in the future. Yeah. Just the final question for me. I just want to say, firstly, thanks for your time. But also, just think like it's the end of the year. It's Christmas. You're with your family. You're celebrating. Where do you see yourself come the end of the year? Hopefully I want to get a fight in before... Before my birthday, preferably, you know, December 17th. <laughs> so I want to get a fight, hopefully, with Caleb Penn or Charlo. Um, but first of all, I got to go in there, take care of work and, uh, on May 21st and have a sens- sensational victory. But before the year ends, I want to give, I want to get another fight, hopefully in December. So uh, we'll see what happens. Well, that's all from me. And um, thanks for your time today, man. Yes, sir. Thank Cheers. you, brother. I appreciate Cheers. the interview. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You.